So we'll be in Luke chapter 23 this morning, starting in verse 26. It was really awesome this, this morning in the hallway as Jonathan was running around crazy. That's my youngest son. He runs up to me and he gives me a hug. He's like, I love you, Daddy. And I'm like, oh, that's so much better than him yelling at me or trying to hit me. But, uh, <clears throat> but I was just encouraged that we can do that to our Abba, our Father, right? We can run to, into his arms because he's, he's made us his children. So um, let's pray together and we'll get started. Thank you, Father, that we can run to your arms. You didn't push us away, but you bring us in. Lord, uh, you know our hearts. You know what we're carrying. You know what we have gone through this week or further in the past. And You know our future. <laughs> Lord, we also thank you that our future is with you. And help us to remember, Lord, that we're only pilgrims. This is not our home. And that this present suffering is not worthy to be compared to the weight of your glory. And uh, we pray, Lord, as we read about the reason why we can run into your arms, Jesus died on the cross, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. That if our hearts are, are growing uh, hard or chasing after other things, that you would call us home today. And Lord, if we're in that place of just worshiping you and in that good fellowship and connection with you. Just encourage us, Lord, through your word. And ultimately, that you would have your way this morning. We ask for your Holy Spirit to speak through your word. In your name we pray, amen. So as, as um, I've been studying for this, uh, this section of scripture, when you, okay, am I the only one that can get so familiar with the story of Jesus that it's, it's just eh, almost another story. A eh, better way to put it is how often do we recognize the weight of Jesus dying on the cross? How, how, how often do we, do we just sit in, in, in awe, in marvel that he would come down to save us? But he had to go through a whole, whole bunch of uh, uh, tests and trials and beatings, as you guys were talking about last week with Mike. And, and it, 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 was, it was just that we need to go, go back to the cross often. I've heard pastors say, you need to preach to yourself every day. You need to preach the gospel to yourself every day because you're forgetful people, <laughs> right? So... Preach the gospel to yourself. And what's the good news? That he would save sinners like all of us. He'd give us grace and mercy. And he would go to the cross on our behalf. So let's go ahead and read verse 26. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. (laughs) Jesus. <laughs> so, if you don't know this, you'll know this now. But this guy was going among many uh, of millions of Jews to worship on Passover. And this is the most holy day of uh, the, the, the Jewish nation. And so, he is going to go worship. He is going to participate in, in, in their greatest um, holiday or And it's also a requirement, but he's walking and he comes from far away, far away. Some some commentators say he must have saved all his life because of how far he traveled to come to go and and celebrate Passover. And yet he's walking to to go do his business, to go worship, and the Romans take him and they say, You're carrying this cross. Imagine what this guy was thinking, feeling like. Excuse me? No, he couldn't say excuse me because they would kill him. But, but just the, the shock, the surprise. I came all the way over here. I set all this up. I planned all this. And this is what happens. The Romans say, bear this cross. And so the, the cross would be, in, in right here what it's saying is the, the cross beam, the, the part where your arms would sit on. Because the beam would stay stationary where, where they would crucify people. So that's what 
That's what he encounters. He's going to worship. He's going to Passover. And they say, you must carry this cross. No option. No option at all. But, huh, I love this verse. Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good for those who are called and, and who love God. And so, um, there, there's, a, there's a truth in here that what might seem or what is a cross is actually a blessing. Why do I say it's a blessing? Because uh, we find in Mark 15, 21 that it mentions his sons by name, which would imply that they were known by other Christians. And in um, the epistle of Paul to the Romans, he writes uh, a greeting to one of his sons. So it, the implication is there. Because of this forced on him um, experience, he got saved. And not only did he get saved, but his children, probably his wife too. Um, why do they make this man carry the cross beam, the cross? Because Jesus could no longer bear it. He was, as you talked about last time, he was whipped, he was spat upon, his, his beard was plucked out, his head was placed, there was a crown placed on it. Not just any crown, but a crown of thorns. And wh one thing that got me was, have you ever had uh, a cut, even a scab where it dries up and you like accidentally rip it open and it stings? So um, some commentators were saying, most likely, so they, 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 they whipped him with some clothes on. And so when the blood finally dried over, then they ripped it off, his, his robe. And um, yeah, he had just been punched in the face. He'd been slapped. He'd, he'd lost all this blood. Uh, a lot of people would die before they even make it to the cross because of the shock, because of heart attack and other, other situations. But Jesus, and not only that, remember he was praying in the garden. He was praying and praying. And as, have you ever been so stressed? And then that night that you're super stressed, which is, you know, not necessarily good. It's not good at all. That when you lay down, you just feel like there's a bunch of weights on you. Yeah, you know that feeling? So, uh, Jesus had been in the most stressful <laughs> time ever, praying. And then he goes and gets beaten and all this stuff. So, then they made him walk with a cross. So, that's why he could no longer carry the cross. And they call upon Simon to carry it for him. And you know what Jesus said? He says, if you want to be my follower, take up your couch cushion and sit down. No, he says, take up your cross. The cross is not pleasant. And ultimately, the cross is to deny yourself. That's what he says in, in, in a different gospel. If you want to follow me, deny yourself and take up your cross. It's his will over yours. That's, that's what it's about. It's, it's that simple. If you want to follow him, his will first. So we're, we're called to carry the cross just like Simon was. And us carrying a cross, us submitting to God's will doesn't save us. It's what we do after we are saved. So, uh, verse 27, And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves. <laughs> what what a, a twist, right? Do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves. And weep for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, and wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. They will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do, do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry wood? Jesus is bloody. Jesus is beaten. Uh, some say most likely unrecognizable. And these, these women are following him. They would, in that culture, they would follow those who were being crucified. Some of the, we, we read some of them are his followers. We read that his mother's there in the other Gospels. And um, so they were weeping. They were, they, were, they were not just tears coming down there, but, ah, ah, you know, that type of weeping. And um, he doesn't say, <laughs> he says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. <laughs> Why? Because in AD 70, there was going to be God's judgment upon the people through the Romans, and they were going to viciously, well, first they starved 
the Jews to basically death, and then they came in and just slaughtered them. And that's why he says, you're going to call out for the, the mountains to fall on you, the hills to come, and, and just end it quickly rather than this long process. And it, even it says, you're going to say, which they would never say. They would never say, oh, how happy are those who can't have babies? No one says that. Right? Of course, in, in the Bible as well, it specifically says, blessed are those who can have babies. But it would be shocking to them, to their ears. Blessed are those who, don't, who can't have babies. Yeah, it'd be, it's, it's better if children are not born in this time, is what he's saying. And then he says, for if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? If they're doing this to me now and I'm innocent, what will, they, what will God do to the guilty? Verse 32, they were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and on, on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. So, in verse uh, 32, he was led with, it was, I'm just going to read it. They were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. In Mark 15, 28, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with transgressors. I'm going to read another scripture, which comes from Isaiah 53, 12. Listen with me, please. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. It was prophesied about the Messiah that he would suffer among criminals, which was not the hope of most Jews. I read that, that was my comment at the end. But this was a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. Isaiah, long before Jesus. Our Messiah will be among criminals. And what's significant about that is there are other scriptures that say, and our, it doesn't say, well, it says the king, the ruler, the Messiah. He will come with an iron fist and smash the clay pots. And the, all the people are like, yeah, that's our, that's our Messiah. It's kind of like, we're going to have a strong leader. Not someone weak, you know. But, um, so these, there's, there's no, there's, Numbers of these prophecies that speak of this strong, ruling, reigning, conquering Messiah. But yet, you also have the suffering Messiah. That he will be pierced for our trans. He will be pierced. I believe it says for our transgressions. He will be beaten. Isaiah talks about how he will have his beard plucked. And so, he's both. Jesus is both. He's a conquering and the suffering. And this was a prophecy <laughs> that was fulfilled. He was led next to two criminals. Verse 33, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, with one on the right and one on the left. So, Calvary, this word means the place of the skull. Some, some commentators and archaeologists say it is called a skull because there's a hill that actually looks like a skull and you can skull. And you can see it today. It's behind a bus stop. Pretty interesting. Or some say it's called Calvary or the, the place of the skull because of death. The skull is what remains. The bones are what remain because of death. So this place was called Calvary where they would crucify and this is where he went. And then, so you could call our church the Springs Skull Chapel but we probably won't do that. But, but in our name Calvary is to remind us what Jesus did for us. That he went to the cross to die for us. And it's, it's a beautiful name when it's Calvary. This doesn't sound as death metal, right? Skull Chapel. To some that might attract some, but um, this is where they went. This is where people went to die. So, 
In verse 34, Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. If you didn't notice, Jesus was caring about other people, even to the point of his death. Right? He says, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. And then you'll see, you'll see throughout, uh, if you read the other Gospels, and I'm going to talk about some of them, he's in, in John, he says, your, uh, my mother is now your mother, John, please take care of her. He, have, you ever, have you ever hurt yourself really bad? Probably the worst pain I felt was like this terrible burning in my ankle when I messed it up, but it, it felt like it was literally someone put fire on my foot. And my thoughts were not, oh, you know, what's my brother doing? What's my mom? What's my parents doing? What are my friends doing? Or I care so much about them. It's like, no, this really hurts. And so for Jesus to be on the cross, well, he's not on the cross yet, but have been being beaten, and say, Father, forgive them. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. He's thinking about others even to the end. He always put others first. And we're called to that as well. This also uh, has a similar ring when Jesus teaches his, or tells his disciples how to pray. Remember that? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts as we forget our, forgive our debtors. And so, that's really the, <laughs> the core of Christianity is you are forgiven, so forgive others. Isn't it? Jesus said to um, the woman who came and, and was pouring out her alabaster jar and, and, and wiping his feet with her hair, he says, you have been forgiven. Well, he tells this to Simon, but he's looking at her. You've been forgiven much, so you know how to love much. But you, Simon, you've been forgiven little, and so therefore you love little. Um, the, way, <laughs> the way you know you're forgiven is you forgive others. Because there's nothing you could ever do to be forgiven. But yet, if you accept that forgiveness, you'll give it out. And that's, <laughs> this is a hard one because you say, I know exactly what they did. I'm not going to forget it. And God might say to you, I know exactly what you did, yet I forgave you. There's actually a parable that says, remember the wicked, the wicked uh, servant where he beats his servant because, well, so one servant owed, the, owed a master a lot of money, an amount of money he couldn't pay. And so the king forgave him, totally debt-free. But that servant had his own servant, and he, paid, he owed a little bit. And what happened? He says, will you forgive me? And he says, no, you better pay it back. And then the master says, you wicked servant! Who are you? Do not forgive. And the whole, that's the whole point. If you're forgiven, who are you to hold it back? You don't have to pretend everything is good or right or everything is okay. No, you forgive. You give it to God. Forgive is to let go. To just release it. To give it to God. That's what forgiveness is. is God, we have an account. God lets go. He burns it. He rips it up. He throws it away. However you want to put it. It's gone. And so we're called to forgive others. Through the help of, of the Holy Spirit. I don't think we have this power with inside of us. Not, not that I don't think. I know we don't. <laughs> we have the, we just, we're just flesh. But God's given us His Spirit to do His will. So, maybe you might need to forgive today. Just like Jesus. And He's innocent. We're not innocent. <laughs> That's a big difference. He's innocent. We're not. And they divided his garments and cast lots. We find this, uh, it's actually a prophecy. It's in Psalms twenty-two, eighteen. It talks about how they will take his clothes and gamble for them. Who gets the clothes? There's, there's like a bunch of prophecies, even concerning the crucifixion. So 
Um, it's, it's kind of amazing how God foretold. I mean, you go to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve had fallen, and then God comes and, and, and judges them and tells them and gives prophecies. It says, the seed will crush, it says, your seed will crush the head of the serpent. Speaking of Jesus crushing Satan's head. So there's, there's a number of prophecies, but we just simply don't have time to, to cover them. But they're fun as they pop up, at least in our account here. So, verse 35, And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the chosen of God, this pathetic man, yeah, some Savior, right? I'm going to save everyone, yet he can't save himself. And it goes on. Let's see. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king, you're supposed to be a king, remember, you're King Jesus, King of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. So everyone could see, this is the King of the Jews. This was not necessarily them confirming that Jesus was the King of the Jews. This was a mocking of Jesus. What would they do to people who were going to be crucified? They would put a name tag on them or this board and say, thief, you know, traitor, whatever. They would put that right on the person um, or they would put a sign. So they put a sign for Jesus. His crime was king of the Jews. A mocking. So you have the religious leaders, you have the soldiers, you have, um, and then you have the criminals. The guys next to him are blaspheming him. And you had Pilate and all the high powers mocking Jesus. Isn't it such a sport for people today to mock Jesus? You have your top podcast, you know, social media influencers. Oh, Jesus this, Jesus that. Just throwing his name out. Don't care. Just trampling over his name. It's a common thing. It's a common thing. Maybe you were even that way at one point. Jesus, who cares about Jesus? And a whole bunch of other comments about him. Everyone has an opinion of Jesus. Some people hate him. I don't really know why, other than he's the light and exposes to darkness. So this, um, so the rulers, they sneered at him. They lifted up their nose. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, I like this description of this um, Greek word. It says, to sneer, to scoff, figuratively, scornfully reject. And then it says, blow someone off, like expelling mucus out of the nose. <laughs> That's what that word is. They just thought low of Jesus. The scum of the earth. That's how they saw him. Soldiers, save, save yourself, right? You have like people like Bill Ma- Maurer, or if you say his name, or Joe Rogan, or... Like I said, the top influencers, Jesus this, Jesus that. None, none giving him his proper place. You have the smartest of the world. Oh, Christianity is so dumb. Kidding me? Fairy tale. Right? That's what a lot of colleges across this nation teach, across the world. Jesus. A lot of people mock Jesus. He's, he wants all of his, his, uh, his followers to be a little sheep, to be a little lamb, to be weak and helpless. Maybe even your coworkers, your family members, mock Jesus. <laughs> Jesus? Okay, when they come, came to arrest Jesus, what happened? Jesus spoke and they all flew to the ground. And he just spoke. I mean, imagine what he could have done to them. <laughs> and what, for those who didn't believe, what he did do to them, what he has done to them. But it's not that he didn't have power or authority. It's as if he saved himself, he couldn't save us. Anyone. If Jesus said, I'm going to put my, <laughs> my will, what I want, because he didn't want to go to the cross. That's why he prayed. If there's any other way, let it be done. When he's in the garden. But he says, not my will be done, but your will be done. So, he could have simply 
snap the finger. He could just start it. They're all making fun of me. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to blow up on them. He didn't. He didn't. He showed grace and mercy. When it says the king of the Jews, it, it brings my memory back to the Old Testament. Remember, there was a period where they had judges and they all failed. They failed pretty badly. Well, it was really the people. They didn't want to be governed by God. <laughs> and then you had, um, then they were crying out, let us have a king, let us have a king like the other nations. So they get their first king. He's handsome. He's awesome for a little bit. And then he just totally, totally fails hard. He tries to become like a priest. He makes these crazy um, pledges and he says no one can eat and then his son Jonathan eats. Anyways, he totally fails. You have David, right? David was this awesome king, but he was also a big failure. Solomon, same thing. He was good, but he was also a big failure. And you just keep going down the line of kings. Good. Some of them good. Some of them just terrible. You had the prophets calling out, come on guys, come on guys, come on guys. They were calling for that king and they never got their true king. And they finally get him, Jesus, the king. No, we don't want him. What? I, I, I remember the first time that clicked in my mind, I just started crying like, wow. They rejected the king. Their king they've been looking for. And how often do people do that? Looking for a king, looking for someone to rule them, because we know we're not good rulers of our own selves. And yet they'll reject Jesus. So, I like what Hebrews chapter 12, verses, uh, I believe it's 2, it says, And looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, I'm going to read that again, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls, because the Hebrews were facing much persecution. So he says, remember Jesus, how he endured the cross and he despised the shame and he endured such hostility as our example as our example so verse 39 says this and one of the criminals who were hanged blaspheming him saying if you are the christ save yourself and us but the other answering rebuked him okay i just got to mention in the other gospels it tells us both of them were were mocking Jesus. But then at some point, this other criminal repents. He changes his mind. So it says, but the other answering rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God seeing you are under the same condemnation? Why are you mocking this man? (laughs) You're, You're guilty. Why would you mock another person that's looking guilty? Verse 41, and we indeed justly for receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. You know what the only thing we deserve in this life is? We only deserve one thing. Death. There's a scripture that says that. For the wages of sin is death. The paycheck, you could say. What you've earned. What you deserve. It's not God's goodness, not good things in life, not health, not prosperity. The only thing you deserved is, I don't know, I'm smiling, it's kind of weird, but the only thing you deserved is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. You can receive something else, you can receive a lot of different things, you can receive His grace. The only thing we deserve is death, and that's what He says here. We indeed justly, for we receive due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. So at some point, this man on the cross changes his mind. He's mocking Jesus, but then he recognizes Jesus is innocent. And this is, this is a, um, basically the ABCs of 1, 2, 3 of salvation. You must recognize that Jesus is innocent. He is the perfect sacrifice. 
perfect sacrifice. That's what's important about this man that he recognizes. You don't see these, you know, these details, but we can pull it out of here. And uh, next, he has, he's humble and he has faith. I haven't read this verse yet, but so it's um, verse 42. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, as surely I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. So this man was humble. This man asked for mercy and not to be condemned. Remember me when you go into your kingdom. (laughs) He didn't say, I am a sinner. Please forgive me for my sins. (laughs) He didn't say that. I like uh, another parable. I believe it was a parable of Jesus. He he talks of, uh, he's ripping on the, the Pharisees and he says, oh, you have this one righteous man who goes up to pray and says, Father, thank you that I'm not like those prostitutes and those tax collectors and those filthy sinners. And on and on. I'm so awesome. And then he says, there was another man who came. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. He bowed his head and he beat on his chest and he said, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he said, I'll tell you which one went away forgiven. It was a man who asked for mercy. (laughs) It is so simple. You can't make it any more simple. Jesus says, If you want to get into heaven, become like a child. You know, child, child, see, I can't even speak. You know, children, God didn't make them geniuses on purpose, you know, to start off. You can grow into that. God made them simple. Give them a lot of innocence and simplicity. So we can learn from them. Learn a lot from them. Especially my own. But isn't that super simple to be saved? Ask for mercy. (laughs) This guy clearly recognized his sin, his wrong. And then he goes to Jesus and says, remember me when you go into your kingdom. It's implied. He doesn't ask, please forgive me for my sins. But it's implied. Jesus didn't say, well, I would save you. I'm sorry, we have to go down and baptize you. But unfortunately, I can't get down. Sorry, I can't. You have to live a really upright life. And then I'll save you. No. He doesn't say you have to Read your Bible 100 hours of the week or whatever. It doesn't say, be a good person. What does he tell him? I promise you, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Contrary to Roman Catholics who believe that souls of people go into a waiting period, purgatory. Sorry, I don't see that anywhere. Okay, what about Mormons? And I'm not, I'm not bashing on them. I'm just stating the truth because I'm pulling this from Jesus. Jesus didn't say, yeah, today you'll be with me in the first level of heaven. No. He says, you will be with me in my kingdom. Isn't, aren't Jesus' words so beautiful and simple? Most of the time they are. Sometimes they're complicated and you're like, huh? most of the time they're pretty straightforward and simple especially when he's talking to someone who believes when he when he talks to those who are not his he makes it really puzzled for them and and blurry well mainly because they can't understand they're blind but (laughs) I love the simplicity of this verse I promise you today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise would be the king's garden, which would be heaven. The, the, the original language is king's garden. <laughs> Jesus' garden, where there's a river of life flowing, where there's the tree of life, where there's a fruits that change constantly, where there's healing for the hurt saints. 
you will be with me there. You didn't do anything, guy. And yet, you'll be with me in paradise. And you, I won't just send you in the back. You'll be with me. This man just asked him to remember him. Just remember me when, you know, when we get there, just give me a spot on the way back and I'll be happy. Or I know I'll be forgotten. So please just remember me. No, you'll be with me today. Isn't that a great confidence that we can have? The moment we breathe our last here is the next moment we breathe our first there. And that's our hope. That is our hope. It also, it also speaks of the afterlife. There is guaranteed an afterlife. People have had this question for ages, from the beginning of time. Where do we come from? What, what should we do? What's my purpose? And where are we going? Jesus answers all of them. Specifically here, he says, there is an eternity. There is heaven and hell. And you can be with me the moment you die, if you trust in me. Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection is proof of the afterlife. There is, death, there is life after death. Either you go to hell or you go to heaven. But I'm encouraged that anyone, whoever believes, can go with the king. Right, Joel? Amen. Verse, verse uh, where are we at? 44. Now it was the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. I just really read that fast, but it says, there was darkness over the entire earth until the ninth hour. Day turned into night. Day turned into night. I don't know if you caught that. That's a phenomenon. That's miraculous. That's creation saying, our creator is dying, is dead, agonizing, wailing, lamenting for her, the creator. The sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And we find from the other gospels, the earth was shaking and dead people came out of the graves. Crazy. You find that in the book of Matthew. This wasn't, this wasn't ordinary, any other ordinary criminal. There was something special about this man. Darkness, day turned into night, would be freaky. Would you admit that? What is going on? Right, solar eclipse, lunar eclipse are awesome. But the, it, you're standing outside, it's daytime, and boom, well, it's morning time, and it becomes night. I would be very freaked out. We go outside, and it turns to night. Something has happened. Very, very important comment by Luke. And the veil of the temple was torn in two. We find in Matthew 27, 51, that the temple veil was torn from top to bottom. From heaven down to earth. Not from earth down up to heaven. See, that's what separates Christianity is God came down from heaven to save man, not man trying to get to heaven. That's what separates Christianity. That's... That's the truth. Nothing we could ever do could get us there. But if we trust on the one who came down, yes. There's also another important part of the veil tearing. What is that? The Holy of Holies. They separated the Holy Holies from the Holy, the holy place. And they would go in there, not just they, one person, high priest would go in there once a year to sprinkle blood on the ark, I mean on the, um, the mercy seat, right? That's what it's called, mercy seat. And so he came to atone for the sins of the nation. Please forgive us, God. We are a wretched people <laughs> coming to God's presence. Yet remember, Jesus says, you will become the temple of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's in John 14. I could be wrong, but I think it's somewhere. It's also in Corinthians you're no, um, you know, you're no longer your own, but you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and so that's why God tore down the old system to put in a new system, the new covenant. The old covenant was becoming obsolete, like sour milk. You won't forget that. Sour, have you ever had sour milk? Disgusting. It's almost like cream cheese. But anyways, 
Um, sour milk. You don't want to pour that in your cereal because you might cry the way it tastes. Food has expiration. The Old Covenant had an expiration date, and that's when Jesus came and died on the cross. There's a new covenant now that we're under. So Jesus, he doesn't have to go there and get scissors and, you know, no. He just, they, God, the Father did it. I don't know, the Holy Spirit. God did it. I could just say that. It's there. It's recorded for us. Um, and that's a blessing. Like I said, in the beginning of the study, you can just run to the Father and be close to him. Run to the throne of grace. And he won't kick you. Get out of here. What are you doing here? Get out of here. I didn't want you here. No, he died to bring us in. To bring us close. To bring us. Yeah, come and, come and spend time with me. This is the whole point of it. Not so that way you can, you know, do these prayers and read your Bible and make this all robotic. No, you can enjoy me. And stop trying to relate to me in formulas and robotically. I got to read my Bible. Okay, did it. I got to pray today. Okay, did it. Oh, I can run to you, Father. I feel like a piece of trash right now. I feel overwhelmed. Or I'm excited. Thank you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It would allow us in. There's no words. And that's why we're going to spend all of eternity saying words to him. All of eternity singing words to him. All of eternity falling down, worshiping him. Doing our crowns. Here, have it all. Take it all. You have everything. Why not start today? We should be practicing. I mean, we do. We do. But maybe a reminder for some. Have you been running to that throne room? With everything? You should. His door is always open. Right? He ripped, he broke down the doors. He could just come in. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. So, verses uh, 46. And Jesus had cried out with a loud voice. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But before he says this, he says about seven um, statements from the cross. And you, what, you, what we can easily forget is that every single time he says something, he has to rub his back against this painful beam and his arms. He's suffocating to death. And he has to go like this, essentially. He has nails in his hands. He has a nail in between his legs. And he has to pull himself up and say something. Like even to say, today you will be with me in paradise, is a lot of words to say on a cross. And so he says now, well, before he says, I commit my hands and uh, I commit my spirit into your hands, he says, it is finished. One of the greatest statements of Jesus, probably the greatest. It's complete. It's paid for. It is done. Hallelujah. That's another way to summarize Christianity. What God has done rather than what man must do. It is done. It's complete. God the Father poured out His wrath on Jesus so that way He wouldn't have to give it to you. Traded places. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness. His perfection. Reflection of God. He said that from the cross. Your sins, you personally, my sins. And think about this. This act was all done past tense. So when he did this, this is all pointing forward. Well, it's pointing in all the time. It actually says in the book of Revelation, and Jesus was crucified before the foundations of the world. Puzzling verse. But I also believe that it gives him the power to forgive, you know, Abraham and all those guys. All the Old Testament guys and women. But he says it's finished. So if you come in today, if I come in today, oh, I feel ashamed or I feel guilty or so on and so forth. You know what you do? 
You go like, you don't have to go like this. You just do how you do it, okay? Don't go like this, though, because people might look at you. What you want to do is say, God, I ask for forgiveness. You died on the cross ready? Wash me. You know what he'll do? No, yeah, you have to say a better prayer. No, you say, yeah, forgiven. I already paid for it. If you read Romans 6, it, it says, and we should no longer continue in sin, that we are dead to sin. We also died with Jesus on the cross. Meaning, pow- this sin's power no longer has to tell us what to do. I mean, of course we're going to sin, but we can choose to, to go forward and to become more like Christ. We're not progressing to get into this higher heaven. We're pro- progressing to become more like Christ. You might say, well, aren't we going to be perfected in heaven? Yes, you will, but it will help your life out a whole lot. If you're mean, you're angry, you're yelling, if you're you know, stomping your feet, if you're cussing people out, if you're punching people, if you're lying, if you're stealing, guess what? It's going to hurt your life. And so God says, get rid of that stuff and it'll be a lot better. <laughs> That's why we are being sanctified, become more like Christ. Not so we can get into this higher position of heaven, but so we can be more useful, faithful on this earth. It is paid. I, I like to think of it uh, this way. I heard this way, I heard it put this way. I'm like, that's good. Where was this all my life? Maybe I wasn't listening. But, okay, Jesus forgave us, right? For all, all of us who believe, Jesus has forgiven you completely, thoroughly. Zero. You have zero, he sees you forgiven. Just like Jesus perfected, perfect, you have his perfection. Yet we still sin. Huh, that's puzzling. I'm a sinner, but yeah, I'm perfected in Christ. I don't understand this. I like to think of it this way. Children, if you're, well, when you're a child, it's like a relationship to a parent. They're your parent, but yet you fail, yet you sin, yet you do wrong, yes, yet they disobey. So you need to go to, uh, you need to, go to your parent and say, please forgive me for the wrong I've done. And not like, oh, I'm sorry I did this. <laughs> you know, when, you, when you, make, you make a little kid say sorry, and they're like, sorry, and they don't mean it. <laughs> not that way, but true repentance, true, true sincerity and uh, sorrow. But if you, go, if you go to your parents and say, I'm sorry, I, I recognize the wrong I did. You're not asking them to be your parent again or to welcome you in as a child again. You're asking them to make the relationship right. Or just like a husband and wife. Married, that's made one, but the relationship can get, they're, they're one, but it can get ugly, right? So it's a quality of the relationship that we're, that asking for forgiveness is about right now. Because Jesus has already paid for our sins. So that was really helpful for me to understand that. It's like, you know, I don't have to do the sinner's prayer a hundred times or something like that. Because it, it, it can happen. It's like, oh, I got I to gotta ask to get saved again because I did this thing that I knew I should have done. No, you don't have to do the sinner's prayer again. You ask for forgiveness. You are forgiven. But are you living free? So, um, Yeah. <laughs> He says, Father, into, my, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And so when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. This man's eyes were also open. Verse 48, And the whole crowd who came together to, to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. They were like, Something is up with this darkness, with this earthquake, with these dead people walking around. Something is up. I'm sure they had the news Pretty, pretty quickly, the veil is torn. What happened? And then eventually, the whole temple would be torn down in thir- about 30 years. But these people are here right now, and they're saying, whoa, something is different about this man. And the centurion, the, the Roman soldier, says, certainly this was a righteous man. We have done wrong. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. It's important that it notes that because most of these um, council members were not. They were evil. They were wicked. They had hatred and they were the ones who put Jesus to death or you know, were, were shouting for that, were stirring the people up to that. And he had not consented to their decision and deed. And he was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man had faith like, remember, 
uh, Simeon, I believe his name was Simeon, Simeon and Anna were there in the temple and they're waiting. And they see Jesus, oh, our Messiah is here. Similar to this guy, he had been waiting for a man like Jesus to appear. Verse 52, then the man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. The woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after and they observed the tomb. Yeah, remember his disciples didn't come at all. They all, you know, abandoned him. And they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So you know what they would do to uh, people crucified when they died, when they were dead? Leave them for the animals. Leave them to show everyone walking in and out of town, you better not do this. You better not do this, or else, here you go. It would be one of these ornaments up here on our road. So, this man, Joseph, he asked for, he asked Pilate for Jesus' body so that way he could give him proper burial. And of course, that way someone can't say, oh, they swapped Jesus' body or anything like that. They couldn't, they actually took him down, laid him in the tomb. Um, and it talks about how Nicodemus, remember John chapter 3, Nicodemus came at night. Him, it was Nicodemus and Joseph who wrapped him and then laid it, and Joseph gave him his tomb. And then it talks about how the women were going to, they had prepared spices and stuff like that, but it was Sabbath, so they had to go home. They had to rest. <laughs> Thankfully, the story doesn't end there, but we're going to end there today. Um, Mike will pick it up next week. And we, uh, if you don't know, Jesus did rise from the dead. Spoiler, spoiler alert, Mike. If you didn't know that, Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. He was seen by over 300 people after his death and resurrection. 300. It's pretty hard to trick and convince a lot of people of a hallucination of, for doing it with 300 people. I mean, of course, there's cults and all this stuff, but... It's pretty hard to get these men to die for a lie, too. They all, almost all the um, apostles died for their faith, for believing in Jesus. If it was a lie, why didn't they just abandon it? Um, at least, you know, even like Muslims and stuff that give their life, you know, these, uh, what do you call them, suicide bombings and whatnot, they don't believe they're believing a, a lie. They believe they're believing the truth, and therefore they act upon that. And so just like these men, of course we have the truth, but I just kind of give that comparison that no one dies for a lie. Everyone, someone will die for what they believe is true. And so, um, I don't even know where I was going with that. But I, I have a conclusion. So, uh, what is awesome about Christianity? What is it awesome about having a relationship with Jesus? A, a living relationship? It's that Jesus says it is done. And I already said this, but it's a great reminder while other people say, all other religions say, do. Do, 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 be, 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 be this, be that, do this, don't do that, be this, don't do that. Like I already said, God came down to save. Man can never get up there on his own. Like it, I had also said this too in, in this message. If you say, I feel ashamed today, I feel dirty, I feel, however you want to describe that. Maybe you don't know Christ. So first of all, I would say, maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you haven't been born again. Maybe you haven't trusted in Jesus. What do you do? Follow the man, the other man on the cross, where he says, basically, have mercy on me. I think that's as simple as, as you get it. You, you can make it is have mercy. And then you believe, you trust in what Jesus has done. He trusted in Jesus that he was actually who he said he was. That's what you have to do. I am a sinner. I have, <laughs> the word confess, I like, I know I'm out of time, but I like how um, this one children's minister put it. Confessing is like tattling on yourself. You know, little kids like, mommy, daddy, they did this, they did that. You know, they, they love doing that. When someone else sins, are like, look at them. But he said, what you want to do when you confess is say, look at me, look at me, what I've done. Not like happy, but you're, you're telling on yourself to God. He, obviously he knows, but he wants you to recognize what you've done. So that's important to salvation is see your sin and then recognize your Savior. 
Only Jesus could save you. You ask for forgiveness. You ask for his spirit. He'll do it. If you're sincere, he'll do it. And then um, lastly, if you are a believer, if you are a believer, someone might be stuck in sin, stuck in their situation, in sinful situation. What do you need to do? Ask for forgiveness. Ask for a cleansing. <laughs> Go to God. He'll take you in and clean you up. He won't, he won't make, you know, I share this with the youth kids. Okay, just because you ask for forgiveness doesn't mean there won't be consequences. Like if you punch someone in the eye, they're going to have a black eye. You say, can you forgive me? Say, okay, I'll forgive you because, you know, I'm supposed to forgive. They're still going to have a black eye, right? So there's consequences for our sin, but we can be forgiven thoroughly. So uh, maybe you might need to do that today. You might need to, to ask God to clean you up a little. You know, Jesus said that when he was washing the disciples' feet. You're bathed, but you need to wash your feet. You're clean, but you still need to be clean because you get dirty still. So maybe you need to do that today. And then uh, another <laughs> response is praise, worship the Savior. Sing to him. Thank him for the free gift of salvation. You don't have to do anything to earn it. And then share it with others. In your lifestyle, but also in your words. Share with others what God has given you. That forgiveness that we love. That kindness. His actual love. Let us be dispensers of that. Let us share that as he has shared it with us. Right? And you know, you know, <laughs> those moments come and they are the hardest. When someone is, is, you know, tearing you up with their words or saying something mean or doing something mean, that's when we're called to forgive. It's not like when things are hard, you have a pass. No. <laughs> we don't. If anyone had a pass, it was Jesus. And he says, I'm not going to do that. No, he's going to humble